Hello, my dear friend. Today we're finally gonna finish the Midnight Library. So far, all the lives Nora Seed has tried disappointed her at some point. Now she's trying the version of herself who accepted a coffee date from Ash. A Pearl in the Shell She opened her eyes from a shallow sleep and the first thing she noticed was that she was incredibly tired. She could see a picture on the wall in the dark. She could just about make out that the picture was a mildly abstract interpretation of a tree. Not a tall and a spindly tree, something short and white and flowery. There was a man next to her asleep. It was impossible to tell as he was turned away from her in the dark and given that he was largely hidden under the duvet whether this man was Ash. Somehow this felt weirder than usual. Of course, to be in bed with a man who she hadn't done anything more with than bury a cat and have a few interesting conversations from behind the counter of a music shop should have felt slightly strange in a normal run of things. But since entering the midnight library, Nora had slowly got used to the peculiar. And just because it was possible that the man was Ash, it was also possible that it wasn't. There was no predicting every future outcome after a single decision. Going for a coffee with Ash might have led, for instance, to Nora falling in love with the person serving the coffee. That was simply the unpredictable nature of quantum physics. She felt her ring finger, two rings. The man turned over, an arm landed across her in the dark and she gently raised it and placed it back on the duvet. Then she took herself out of bed. Her plan was to go downstairs and maybe lie on the sofa and, as usual, do some research about herself on her phone. It was a curious fact that no matter how many lives she had experienced and no matter how different those lives were, she almost always had her phone by the bed. And in this life, it was no different. So she grabbed it and sneaked out of the room quietly. Whoever the man was, he was a deep sleeper and didn't stare. She stared at him. Nora? He mumbled, half asleep. It was him. She was almost sure of it. Ash. I'm just going to the loo, she said. He mumbled something close to an okay and fell back asleep. And she trod gently across the floorboards. But the moment she opened the door and stepped out of the room, she nearly jumped out of her skin. For there, in front of her, in the half-light of the landing, was another human. A small one, child size. Mommy, I had a nightmare. By the soft light of the dimmed bulb in the hallway, she could see the girl's face. Her fine hair wild from sleep, the strands sticking to her clammy forehead. Nora said nothing. This was her daughter. How could she say anything? The now familiar question raised itself. How could she just join in to a life that she was years late for? Nora closed her eyes. The other lives in which she'd had children had only lasted a couple of minutes or so. This one was already leading into unknown territory. Her body shook with whatever she was trying to keep inside. She didn't want to see her, not just for herself, but for the girl as well. It seemed a betrayal. Nora was her mother, but also, in another, more important way, she was not her mother. She was just a strange woman in a strange house looking at a strange child. Mommy, can you hear me? I had a nightmare. She heard the man move in his bed somewhere in the room behind her. This would only become more awkward if he woke up properly, so Nora decided to speak to the child. Oh, oh, that's a shame, she whispered. It's not real, though. It was just a dream. It was about bears. Nora closed the door behind her. Bears? Because of that story. Right, yes, the story. Come on, get back in your bed. This sounded harsh, she realized. Sweetheart, she added, wondering what she, her daughter in this universe, was called. There are no bears here. Only teddy bears. Yes, only. The girl became a little more awake. Her eyes brightened. She saw her mother. So for a second, Nora felt like that, like her mother. She felt the strangeness of being connected to the world through someone else. Mommy, what were you doing? She was speaking loudly. She was deeply serious in the way that only four-year-olds 
She couldn't have been much older, could be. Shh, Nora said. She really needed to know the girl's name. Names had power. If you didn't know your own daughter's name, you had no control whatsoever. Listen, Nora whispered. I'm just going to go downstairs and do something. You go back to bed. But the bears. There aren't any bears. There are in my dreams. Nora remembered the polar bears speeding towards her in the fog. Remembered that fear, that desire in that sudden moment to live. There won't be this time, I promise. Mommy, why are you speaking like that? Like what? Like that. Whispering? No. Nora had no idea what the girl thought she was speaking like. What the gap was between her now and her, the mother. Did motherhood affect the way you spoke? Like you're scared. The girl clarified. I'm not scared. I want someone to hold my hand. What? I want someone to hold my hand. Right. Silly mommy. Yes, yes, I'm silly. I'm really scared. She said this quietly, matter of fact. And it was then that Nora looked at her, really properly looked at her. The girl seemed wholly alien and wholly familiar all at once. Nora felt a swell of something inside her, something powerful and worrying. The girl was staring at her in a way no one had stared at her before. It was a scary the emotion. She had Nora's mouth and that a slightly lost look that people had sometimes attributed to her. She was beautiful and she was hers, or kind of hers, and she felt a swell of irrational love, a surge of it, and knew if the library wasn't coming for her right now, and it wasn't, that she had to get away. Mommy, will you hold my hand? I... I... The girl put her hand in Nora's. It felt so small and warm, and it made her feel sad. The way it relaxed into her, as natural as a pearl in a shell. She pulled Nora towards the adjacent room, the girl's bedroom. Nora closed the door nearly shut behind her and tried to check the time on her watch. But in this life, it was a classic-looking analog watch with no light display. So it took a second or two for her eyes to adjust. She double-checked the time on her phone as well. It was 2.32 a.m. So depending when she had gone to bed in this life... This version of her body hadn't had much sleep. It certainly felt like it hadn't. What happens when you die, mommy? <laughs> I always love these random, scary questions kids ask that freaks out the adults. It wasn't totally dark in the room. There was a silver light coming in from the hallway, and there was a nearby street lamp that meant a thin glow filtered through the dark pattern curtains. She could see this squat rectangle that was Nora's bed. She could see the silhouette of a cuddly toy elephant on the floor. There were other toys too. It was a happily cluttered room. Her eyes shone at Nora. I don't know, Nora said. I don't think anyone knows for sure. She frowned. This didn't satisfy her. This didn't satisfy her one bit. Listen, Nora said. There is a chance that just before you die, you'll get a chance to live again. You can have things you didn't have before. You can choose the life you want. That sounds good. But you don't have to have this worry for a very long time. You're going to have a life full of exciting adventures. There will be so many happy things. Like camping? A burst of warmth radiated through Nora as she smiled at the sweet girl. Yes, like camping. I love it when we go camping. Nora's smile was still there, but she felt tears behind her eyes. This seemed a good life, a family of her own, a daughter to go on camping holidays with. Listen, she said as she realized she wasn't going to be able to escape the bedroom anytime soon. When you have worries about things you don't know about, like the future, it's a very good idea to remind yourself of things you do know. I don't understand, the girl said snuggled under her duvet as Nora sat on the floor beside her. Well, it's like a game. I like games. Shall we play a game? Yes, smiled her daughter. Let's. The game. I ask you something we already know and you say the answer. So if I ask what is mommy's name, you would say Nora. Get it? 
I think so. So what is your name? Molly. Okay, what is Daddy's name? Daddy. But what is his actual name? Ash. Well, that was a really successful coffee date. And where do we live? Cambridge. Cambridge. It kind of made sense. Nora had always liked Cambridge, and it was only thirty miles from Bedford. Ash must have liked it too, and it was a still comfortable distance from London. If he still worked there, briefly after getting her first from Bristol, she had applied to do an MPhil in philosophy and had been offered a place at Keys College. What part of Cambridge can you remember? What is our street called? We live on Bol Bolton Road. Well done. And do you have any brothers or sisters? No. And do mommy and daddy like each other? Molly laughed a little at that. Yes. Do we ever shout? The laugh became cheeky. Sometimes, especially mommy. Sorry. You only shout when you're really, really, really tired, and you say sorry, so it is okay. Everything is okay if you say sorry. That's what you say. Does mommy go out to work? Yes, sometimes. Do I still work at the shop where I met daddy? No. What does mommy do when she goes out to work? Teaches people. How does she?、Mm, how do I teach people? What do I teach? Phil, philosophy, philosophy. That's what I said. And where do I teach that? At a university. Yes. Which university? Then she remembered where they live. At Cambridge University. That's it. She tried to fill in the gaps. Maybe in this life she had reapplied to do a master's. And on successfully completing that, she had got into teaching there. Either way, if she was going to bluff in this life, she was probably going to have to read some more philosophy. But then Molly said, "But you're stopping now." Stopping? Why am I stopping? To do books. Books for you? No, silly. To do a grown-up book. I'm writing a book. Yes, I just said. I know. I'm just trying to get you to say something twice, because it is doubly nice, and it makes bears even less scary. Okay? Okay. Does Daddy work? Yes. Do you know what Daddy's job is? Yes, he cuts people. For a brief moment, she forgot Ash was a surgeon and wondered if she was in the house of a serial killer. Cuts people. Yes, he cuts people's bodies and makes them better. Ah, yes, of course. He saves people. Yes, he does. Except when he's sad and the person died. Yes, that is sad. Does Daddy work in Bedford still, or does he work in Cambridge now? She shrugged. Cambridge. Does he play music? Yes, yes, he plays the music. But very, 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 very badly. She giggled as she said that. Nora laughed too. Molly's giggle was contagious. It's.、Uh, do you have any aunts and uncles? Yes, I have Aunt Jaya. Who is Aunt Jaya? Daddy's sister. Anyone else? Yes, Uncle Joe and Uncle Evan. Nora felt relieved her brother was alive in this lifetime. And that he was with the same man he was with in her Olympic life, and he was clearly in their lives enough for Molly to know his name. When did we last see Uncle Joe? Christmas. Do you like Uncle Joe? Yes, he's funny, and he gave me panda. Panda? My best cuddly. Pandas are bears too. Nice bears. Molly yawned. She was getting sleepy. Do mommy and Uncle Joe like each other? Yes, you always talk on the phone. This was interesting. Nora had assumed the only lives in which she still got on with her brother were the lives in which she had never been in the labyrinth. Unlike her decision to keep swimming, the coffee date with Ash postdated her experience in the labyrinth. But this was throwing that theory. 
Nora couldn't help but wonder if this lovely Molly herself was the missing link. Maybe this little girl in front of her had healed the rift between her and her brother. Do you have grandparents? Only Grandma Sal. Nora wanted to ask more about her own parents' death, but this probably wasn't the time. Are you happy? I mean, when you aren't thinking about bears? I think so. Are mommy and daddy happy? Yes, she said slowly. Sometimes when you're not tired. And do we have lots of fun times? She rubbed her eyes. Yes. And do we have any pets? Yes, Plato. And who is Plato? Our dog. And what type of dog is Plato? But she got no answer because Molly was asleep, and Nora lay there on the carpet and closed her eyes. When she woke up, a tongue was licking her face. A Labrador with a smiling eyes and a waggy tail seemed amused or excited to see her. Plato, she asked sleepily. That's me. Plato seemed to wag. It was morning. Light flooded through the curtains now. Cuddly toys, including Panda and the elephant Nora had identified earlier, littered the floor. She looked at the bed and saw it was empty. Molly wasn't in the room, and there were feet, heavier feet than Molly's, coming up the stairs. She sat up and knew she must look terrible after sleeping on the carpet, in a baggy cure T-shirt which she recognized and tartan pajama bottoms which she didn't. She felt her face and it was creased from where she had been laying. And her hair, which was longer in this life, felt dirty and bedraggled. She tried to make herself look as presentable as it was possible to look in the two seconds before the arrival of a man she simultaneously slept with every night, and also hadn't ever slept with Schrodinger's husband, so to speak. And then suddenly, there he was. The perfect life. Ash's gangly, handsome boyishness had only been modestly dented by fatherhood. If anything, he looked healthier than he had done on her doorstep, and like then he was wearing running gear. Though here the clothes seemed a bit fancier and more expensive, and he had some kind of fitness tracker attached to his arm. He was smiling and holding two cups of coffee, one of which was for Nora. She wondered how many coffees they had shared together since the first. Oh, thank you. Oh no, Nor, did you sleep in here all night? He asked. Nor. Most of it. I meant to go back to bed, but Molly was in a state. I had to calm her, and then I was too tired to move. Oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't hear her. He seemed genuinely sad. It was probably my fault. I showed her some bears on YouTube yesterday before work. No worries. Anyway, I walked Plato. I'm not in the hospital till midday today. It's going to be a late one. Are you still wanting to go into the library today? Oh, you know what? I might give it a miss. Okay, well, I got Mal some brekky and will drop her off at school. I can't take Molly," said Nora. "If you've got a big day, oh, it's an okay one—a gallbladder and a pancreas so far. Easy street. I'm going to get a run in. Right? Yes, of course. For the half marathon on Sunday. What? Nothing. It doesn't matter," Nora said. "I'm just delirious from sleeping on the floor." No worries. Anyway, my sister phoned. They want her to illustrate the calendar for Kew Gardens. Lots of plants. She's really pleased. He smiled. He seemed happy for the sister of his, who Nora had never heard of. She wanted to thank him for being so good about her dead cat, but she obviously couldn't. So she just said, "Thank you." For what? Just you know everything. All right. Okay. So thank you," he nodded. "That's nice. Anyway, run time." He drained his coffee and then disappeared. Nora scanned the room, absorbing every new piece of information, every cuddly toy and book and plug socket, as if they were all part of a jigsaw of her life. An hour later, Molly was being dropped off at her infant school, and Nora was doing the usual, checking her emails and social media. Her social media activity wasn't great in this life, which was always a promising sign. But she did have a hell of a lot of emails. From these emails, she divined that she was not simply stopping teaching at the moment, but had officially stopped. 
She was on a sabbatical in order to write a book about Henry David Thoreau and his relevance for the modern-day environmentalist movement. Later in the year, she planned to visit Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, funded by a research grant. This seemed pretty good, almost annoyingly good. A good life with a good daughter and a good man in a good house in a good town. It was an excess of good, a life where she could sit down all day reading and researching and writing about her all-time favorite philosopher. This is cool, she told the dog. Isn't this cool? Plato yawned indifference. Then she set about exploring her house, being watched by the Labrador from the comfy-looking sofa. The living room was vast, her feet sunk into the soft rug. White floorboards, TV, wood burner, electric piano, two new laptops on charge, a mahogany chest on which perched an ornate chess set, nicely stacked bookshelves, a lovely guitar resting in the corner, Nora recognized the model instantly as an electroacoustic midnight stain, Fender Malibu. She had sold one during her last week working at the String Theory. There were photos in frames dotted around the living room, kids she didn't know with a woman who looked like Ash, presumably his sister, an old photo of her deceased parents on their wedding day, and one of her and Ash getting married. She could see her brother in the background, a photo of Plato, and one of a baby, presumably Molly. She glanced at the books, some yoga manuals, but not the second-hand ones she owned in her root life, some medical books. She recognized her copy of Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy, along with Henry David Thoreau's Walden, both of which she'd owned since university. A familiar Principles of Geology was also there. There were quite a few books on Thoreau, and copies of Plato's Republic and Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, which she did own in her root life, but not in these editions. Intellectual-looking books by people like Julia Kristeva and Judith Butler and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. There were a lot of works on Eastern philosophy that she had never read before, and she wondered if she stayed in this life, and she couldn't see why not whether there was a way to read them all before she had to do any more teaching at Cambridge. Novels, some Dickens, The Bell Jar, some geeky pop science books, a few music books, a few parenting manuals, Nature by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, some stuff on climate change, and a large hardback called Arctic Dreams, Imagination and Desire in a Northern Landscape. She had rarely, if ever, been this consistently highbrow. This was clearly what happened when you did a master's degree at Cambridge and then went on sabbatical to write a book on your favorite philosopher. You're impressed by me? She told the dog. You can't admit it. There was also a pile of music songbooks, and Nora smiled when she saw that the one on top was the Simon and Garfunkel one she had sold to Ash the day he had asked her out for a coffee. On the coffee table, there was a nice glossy hardback book of photographs of the Spanish scenery, and on the sofa, there was something called the Encyclopedia of Plants and Flowers. And in the magazine rack, there was the brand new National Geographic with the picture of the black hole on the cover. There was a picture on the wall, a Miro painting from a museum in Barcelona. Have me and Ash been to Barcelona together, Plato? She imagined them both hand in hand, wandering the streets of the Gothic Quarter together, popping into a bar for tapas and roja. On the wall opposite the bookshelves, there was a mirror, a broad mirror with an ornate white frame. She no longer got surprised by the variations in appearance between lives. She had been every shape and size and had every haircut. In this life, she looked perfectly pleasant. She would have liked to be friends with this person, it wasn't an Olympian or a rock star or a Cirque du Soleil acrobat she was looking at, but it was someone who seemed to be having a good life, as far as you could tell these things. A grown-up who had a vague idea of who she was and what she was doing in life. Short hair, but not dramatically so. The skin looking healthier than in her root life. 
either through diet, a lack of red wine, exercise, or the cleansers and moisturizers she had seen in the bathroom, which were all more expensive than anything she owned in her root life. Well, she said to Plato, this is a nice life, yeah? Plato seemed to agree. A spiritual quest for a deeper connection with the universe. She found a medicine drawer in the kitchen and rummaged through the plasters and ibuprofen and calpol and multivitamins and runner's knee bandages, but couldn't find any sign of any antidepressants. Maybe this was it. Maybe this was finally the life she was going to stay put in. The life she would choose, the one she would not return to the shelves. I could be happy here. A little later, in the shower, she scanned her body for new marks. There were no tattoos, but there was a scar. Not a self-inflicted scar, but a surgical-looking one. A long, delicate, horizontal line below her navel. She had seen a cesarean scar before, and now she stroked her thumb along it. Thinking that even if she stayed in this life, she would have always turned up late for it. Ash came back home from dropping Molly off. She hastily dressed so he wouldn't see her naked. They had breakfast together. They sat at their kitchen table and scrolled the day's news and ate sourdough toast and were very much like a living endorsement for marriage. And then Ash went to the hospital and she stayed home to research through all day. She read her work in progress, which already had an impressive word count of 42,729 and sat eating toast before picking Molly up from school. Molly wanted to go to the park like normal to feed the ducks, and so Nora took her, disguising the fact that she was using Google Maps to navigate her way there. Nora pushed her on the swing till her arm ached, slid down the slides with her, and crawled behind her through large metallic tunnels. They then drew dry oats into the pond for the ducks, scooped from a box of porridge. Then she sat down with Molly in front of the telly, and then she fed her her dinner and read a bedtime story all before Ash returned home. After Ash came home, a man came to the door and tried to get in, and Nora shut the door in his face. Nora? Yes. Why were you so weird to Adam? What? I think he was a little bit put out. What do you mean? You acted like he was a stranger. Oh... Nora smiled. Sorry. He's been our neighbor for three years. We went camping with him and Hannah in the Lake District. Yes, I know, of course. You look like you weren't letting him in. Like he was an intruder or something. Did I? You shut the door in his face. I shut the door. It wasn't in his face. I mean, I mean, yes, his face was there, technically, but... I just didn't want him to think he could barge in. He was bringing the hose back. Oh, right. Well, we don't need the hose. Hoses are bad for the planet. Are you okay? Why wouldn't I be? I just worry about you. Generally, though, things turned out pretty good. And every time she wondered if she would wake up back in the library, she didn't. One day after her yoga class, Nora sat on a bench by the river cam and reread some through. The day after, she watched Ryan Bailey on daytime TV being interviewed on the set of Last Chance Saloon 2, in which he said he was on a spiritual quest for a deeper connection with the universe, rather than worrying about settling down in a romantic context. She received whale photos from Izzy, and WhatsApped her to say that she had heard about a horrid car crash in Australia recently, and made Izzy promise she would always drive safely. Nora was comforted to know she had no inclination whatsoever to see what Dan was doing with his life. Instead, she felt very grateful to be with Ash, or rather, and more precisely, she imagined she was grateful, because he was lovely, and there were so many moments of joy and laughter and love. Ash did long shifts, but was easy to be around when he was in even after days of blood and stress and gallbladders. He was also a bit of a nerd. He always said good morning to elderly people in the street when walking the dog, and sometimes they ignored him. He sang along to the car radio. He generally didn't seem to need sleep, and was always fine doing the Molly night shift even when he was in surgery the next day. He loved to gross Molly out with facts. 
A stomach gets a new lining every four days. Earwax is a type of sweat. You have creatures called mites living in your eyelashes and love to be inappropriate. He at the duck pond the first Saturday within Molly's earshot enthusiastically told a random stranger that male ducks have penises shaped like corkscrews. <laughs> On nights when he was home early enough to cook, he made a great lentil doll and a pretty good penny arabiata and tended to put a whole bulb of garlic in every meal he created. But Molly had been absolutely right. His artistic talents didn't extend to musical ability. In fact, when he sang this Sound of Silence, accompanied by his guitar, she found herself guiltily wishing he would take the title literally. <laughs> he was, in other words, a bit of a dork, a dork who saved lives on a daily basis, but still a dork, which was good. Nora liked dorks, and she felt one herself, and it helped make her get over the fundamental peculiarity of being with a husband you were only just getting to know. This is a good life. Nora would think to herself over and over again. Yes, being a parent was exhausting, but Molly was easy to love, at least in daylight hours. In fact, Nora often preferred it when Molly was home from school because it added a bit of challenge to what was otherwise a rather frictionless existence. In fact, Nora often preferred it when Molly was home from school because it added a bit of challenge to what was otherwise a rather frictionless existence. No relationship stress, no work stress, no money stress. It was a lot to be grateful for. There were inevitably shaky moments. She felt the familiar feeling of being in a play for which she didn't know the lines. Is anything wrong? She asked Ash one night. It's just... He looked at her with his kind smile and intense scrutinizing eyes. I don't know. You forgot our anniversary was coming up. You think you haven't seen films you've seen, and vice versa. You forgot you had a bike. You forget where the plates are. You've been wearing my slippers. You get into my side of the bed. Jeez, Ash, she said a little bit too tense. It's like being intrigated by the three bears. I just worry. I'm fine, just, you know, lost in research world, lost in the woods, through woods. And she felt in those moments that maybe she'd return to the midnight library. Sometimes she remembered the words of Mrs. Elm on her first visit there. If you really want to live a life hard enough, you don't have to worry. The moment you decide you want that life, really want it, then everything that exists in your head now, including this midnight library, will eventually be a dream. A memory so vague and intangible it will hardly be there at all. Which begged the question, if this was the perfect life, why hadn't she forgotten the library? Occasionally, she felt wisps of gentle depression float around her, for no real reason, but it wasn't comparable to how terrible she had felt in her root life, or indeed, many of her other lives. It was like comparing a bit of a sniffle to pneumonia, when she thought about how bad she had felt the day she lost her job at a string theory, of the despair, of the lonely and desperate yearning to not exist, then this was nowhere near. Every day she went to bed thinking she was going to wake up in this life again, because it was, on balance, and all things considered, the best she had known. Indeed, she progressed from going to bed casually assuming she'd stay in this life, to being scared to fall asleep in case she wouldn't. And yet, night after night, she would fall asleep and day after day, she would wake up in the same bed. Occasionally on the carpet, but she shared that pain with Ash. And more often than not, it was a bed as Molly was getting better and better at the sleeping through. There were awkward moments, of course. Nora never knew the way to anything or where things were in the house. And Ash sometimes wondered out loud if she should see a doctor. And at first, she had avoided sex with him, but one night it happened, and afterwards, Nora felt guilty about the lie she was living. They lay in the dark for a while, in post-coital silence, but she knew she had to broach the subject, test the water. Ash, she said. What? Do you believe in the theory of parallel universes? She could see his face stretch into a smile, 
This was the kind of conversation on his wavelength. Yes, I think so. Me too. I mean, it's science, isn't it? It's not like some geeky physicist just thought, hey, parallel universes are cool. Let's make a theory about them. Yeah, he agreed. Science distrusts anything that sounds too cool, too sci-fi. Scientists are skeptics as a rule. Exactly, yet physicists believe in parallel universes. It's just where the science leads, isn't it? Everything in quantum mechanics and string theory all points to there being multiple universes, many, many universes. Well, what would you do if I said that I have visited my other lives and I think I have chosen this one? I would think you were insane, but I'd still like you. Well, I have. I have had many lives. He smiled. Great. Is there one where you kiss me again? There is one where you buried my dead cat. He laughed. That's so cool, Nor. The thing I like about you is that you always make me feel normal. And that was it. She realized that you could be as honest as possible in life, but people only see the truth if it is close enough to their reality. As Thoreau wrote, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And Ash only saw the Nora she had fallen in love with and married. And so, in a way, that was the Nora she was becoming. Hammersmith During half-term, while Molly was off school and on a Tuesday when Ash wasn't in the hospital, they popped on a train to London to see Nora's brother and Evan in their flat in Hammersmith. Joe looked well, and his husband looked the same as he had when Nora had seen him on her brother's phone in her Olympic life. Joe and Evan met at a cross-training class at their local gym. Joe was, in this life, working as a sound engineer, while Evan, Dr. Evan Langford to be precise, was a consultant radiologist for the Royal Marsden Hospital, so he and Ash had a lot of hospital-related stuff to moan about together. Joe and Evan were lovely with Molly, asking her detailed questions about what Panda was up to, and Joe cooked them all a great garlicky pasta and broccoli meal. It's Polian, apparently, he told Nora getting a bit of our heritage in there. Nora thought of her Italian grandfather and wondered what he had felt like when he realized the London Brick Company was actually based in Bedford. Had he been truly disappointed? Or had he actually just decided to make the most of it? There was probably a version of their grandfather who went to London and on his first day got run over by a double-decker bus at Piccadilly Circus. Joanne Ewen had a full wine rack in the kitchen and Nora noticed that one of the bottles was a Californian Syrah from the Buena Vista vineyard. Nora felt her skin prickle as she saw the two printed signatures at the bottom, Alicia and Eduardo Martinez. She smiled, sensing Eduardo was just as happy in this life. She wondered momentarily who Alicia was and what she was like. At least there were good sunsets there. You okay? asked Ash as Nora gazed absent-mindedly at the label. Yeah, sure. It just, um, looks like a good one. That's my absolute fave, said Evan. Such a bloody good wine. Shall we get it open? Well, said Nora, only if you were going to have a drink anyway. Well, I'm not, said Joe. I've been overdoing it a bit recently. I mean a little teetotal patch. You know what your bros like added Ewan, planting a kiss on Joe's cheek. All or nothing. Oh yeah, I do. Ewan already had the corkscrew in his hand. Had one hell of a day at work, so I'm happy to guzzle the whole lot straight from the bottle if no one will join me. I'm in, said Ash. I'm okay, said Nora, remembering that the last time she had seen him in the business lounge of a hotel, her brother had confessed to being an alcoholic. They gave Molly a picture book and Nora read it with her on the sofa. The evening progressed. They talked news and music and movies. Joe and Ewan had quite enjoyed Last Chance Saloon. A little while later, and to everyone's surprise, Nora took a left turn out of the safe environs of pop culture and cut to the chase with her brother. Did you ever get pissed off with me, you know, for backing out of the band? That was years ago, sis. Lot of water under the bridge since then. You wanted to be a rock star, though. He still is a rock star. 
said Ewan, laughing. But he's all mine. I always feel like I let you down, Joe. Well, don't. But I feel like I let you down, too. Because I was such an idiot. I was hurried to you for a little while. These words felt like a tonic she had been waiting years to hear. Don't worry about it, she managed. Before I was with Even, I was so dumb about mental health. I thought panic attacks were a big nothing. You know, mind over matter, man up, sis. But then, when Even started having them, I understood how real they are. It wasn't just the panic attacks. It just felt wrong. I don't know. For what it's worth, I think you're happier in this life than the one where you're, she nearly said dead, in a band. Her brother smiled and looked at Ewen. She doubted he believed it, but Nora had to accept that, as she now knew only too well, some truths were just impossible to see. Tricycle As the weeks went by, Nora began to feel something remarkable start to happen. She began to remember aspects of her life that she had never actually lived. For instance, one day someone she had never known in her root life a friend she had apparently known while studying and teaching at the university, phoned her about meeting for lunch. And as the caller Laura came up on the phone, a name came to her, Laura Bryan. And she pictured her completely and somehow knew her partner was called Mo and that they had a baby called Aldous. And then she met her and all these things confirmed. This sort of deja vu happened increasingly. Yes, of course, there were the occasional slip-ups she made, like forgetting Ash had asthma, which she tried to keep under control via running. How long have you had it? Since I was seven. Oh yes, of course. I thought you'd said eczema. Nora, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. It's just I had some wine with Laura at lunch and I feel a bit spaced out. But slowly, these slip-ups became less frequent. It was as though each day was a piece fitting into a puzzle and, with each piece added, it became easier to know what the absent pieces were going to look like. Whereas in every other life she had been continually grasping for clues and feeling like she was acting. In this one, she increasingly found that the more she relaxed into it, the more things came to her. Nora also loved spending time with Molly. The cozy anarchy of her playing in her bedroom or the delicate bonding that happened at a story time, reading the simple magical brilliance of the tiger who came to tea, or hanging out in the garden. Watch me, mommy, said Molly as she pedaled away on her tricycle one Saturday morning. Mommy, look! Are you watching? That's very good, Molly. Good pedaling. Mommy, look! Zoom me! Go, Molly! But then the front wheel of the tricycle slipped off the lawn and down into the flower bed. Molly fell off and knocked her head hard on a small rock. Nora rushed over and picked her up and had a look at her. Molly was clearly hurt with a scrape on her forehead. The skin grazed and bleeding, but she didn't want to show it even as her chin wobbled. I'm all right, she said slowly in a voice as fragile as porcelain. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. Each all right got progressively closer to tears. Then horseshoe back around to calm again. For all her nocturnal fears about bears, she had a resilience to her that Nora couldn't help but admire and be inspired by. This little human being had come from her, was in some way a part of her, and if she had hidden a strength, then maybe Nora did too. Nora hugged her. It's all right, baby. My brave girl. It's okay. How does it feel now, darling? It's okay. It's like on holiday. On holiday? Yes, mommy. She said a little upset Nora couldn't remember. The slide. Oh, yes, of course, the slide. Yes, yeah, silly me. Silly mommy. Nora felt something inside her all at once, a kind of fear, as real as the fear she had felt on the Arctic scary, face to face with the polar bear, a fear of what she was feeling, love. You could eat in the finest restaurants, you could partake in every sensual pleasure, you could sing on stage in Sao Paulo to 20,000 people, 
You could soak up whole thunderstorms of applause. You could travel to the ends of the earth. You could be followed by millions on the internet. You could win Olympic medals, but this was all meaningless without love. And then she thought of her root life, the fundamental problem with it, the thing that had left her vulnerable, really, was the absence of love. Even her brother hadn't wanted her in that life. There had been no one once Waltz had died. She had loved no one, and no one had loved her back. She had been empty. Her life had been empty, walking around, faking some kinds of human normality, like a sentient mannequin of despair, just the bare bones of getting through. Yet there, right there in that garden in Cambridge, under the dull gray sky, she felt the power of it, the terrifying power of caring deeply and being cared for deeply. Okay, her parents were still dead in this life, but here there was Molly, there was Ash, there was Joe, there was a net of love to break her fall. And yet she sensed deep down that it would all come to an end soon. She sensed that, for all the perfection here, there was something wrong amid the rightness. And the thing that was wrong couldn't be fixed because the flaw was the rightness itself. Everything was right, and yet she hadn't earned this. She had joined the movie halfway. She had taken the book from the library, but truthfully, she didn't own it. She was watching her life as if from behind a window. She was, she began to feel, a fraud. She wanted this to be her life as in her real life, and it wasn't, and she just wished she could forget that fact. She really did. Mommy, are you crying? No, Molly, no, I'm fine. Mommy's fine. You look like you're crying. Let's just get you cleaned up. Later that same day, Molly pieced together a jigsaw of jungle animals. Nora sat on the sofa, stroking Polito as his warm, weighty head rested on her lap. She stared at the ornate chess set that was sitting there on the mahogany chest. A thought rose slowly, and she dismissed it, but then it rose again. As soon as Ash came home, she told him she wanted to see an old friend from Bedford and wouldn't be back for a few hours. No longer here. As soon as Nora entered Oak Leaf Residential Care Home, and before she'd even reached the reception, she saw a frail elderly man wearing glasses whom she recognized. He was having a slightly heated conversation with a nurse who looked exasperated, like a sigh turned into a human. I really would like to go in the garden, the old man said. I'm sorry, but the garden is being used today. I just want to sit on the bench and read the newspaper. Maybe if you signed up for the gardening activity session... I don't want a gardening session. I want to call Havok. This was all a mistake. Nora had heard her old neighbor talk about his son Havok before when she had dropped off his medication. Apparently, his son had been pushing for him to go to a care home, but Mr. Banerjee had insisted on holding on to his house. Is there no way I can just... He noticed at this point that he was being stared at. Mr. Banerjee? He stared at Nora, confused. Hello? Who are you? I'm Nora, you know, Nora Seed. Then, feeling too flustered to think, she added, I'm your neighbor on Bancroft Avenue. He shook his head. I think you've made a mistake, dear. I haven't lived there for three years, and I am very sure you were not my neighbor. The nurse tilted her head at Mr. Banerjee as if he was a confused puppy. Maybe you've forgotten. No said Nora quickly, realizing her mistake. He was right. I was confused. I have memory issues sometimes. I never lived there. It was somewhere else and someone else. I'm sorry. They resumed their conversation as Nora thought about Mr. Banerjee's front garden full of irises and foxgloves. Can I help you? She turned to look at the receptionist, a mild-mannered, red-haired man with glasses and blotched skin and a gentle Scottish accent. She told him who she was and that she had phoned earlier. He was a little confused at first. And you say you left a message? He hummed a quiet tune as he searched for her email. Yes, but on the phone. I was trying for ages to get through and I couldn't. So I eventually left a message. I emailed as well. All right, I see. Well, I'm sorry about that. Are you here to see a family member? No, 
Nora explained. "I'm not family. I'm just someone who used to know her. She'd know me, though. Her name is Mrs. Elm." Nora tried to remember the full name. "Sorry, it's Louise Elm. If you told her my name, Nora, Nora Seed, she used to be my. She was the school librarian at Hazel Dean. I just thought she might like some company." The man stopped looking at his computer and stared up at Nora with barely suppressed surprise. At first, Nora thought that she had got it wrong, or Delenn had got it wrong that evening at La Cantina, or maybe the Mrs. Elm in that life had experienced a different fate in this life. Though Nora didn't quite know how her own decision to work in an animal shelter would have led to a different outcome for Mrs. Elm in this life, but that made no sense. As in neither life had she been in touch with the librarian since the school. What's the matter? Nora asked the receptionist. I'm very sorry to tell you this, but Louise Elm is no longer here. Where is she? She actually she died three weeks ago. At first, she thought it must be an admin error. Are you sure? Yes, I'm afraid I'm very sure. Oh. Said Nora. She didn't really know what to say or to feel. She looked down at her tote bag that had sat beside her in the car, a bag containing the chess set she had brought to play a game with her and to keep her company. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't. You see, I haven't seen her for years, years and years. But, but I heard from someone who said that she was here. So sorry, the receptionist said. No, no worries. I just wanted to thank her for being so kind to me. She died very peacefully, he said, literally in her sleep. And Nora smiled and retreated politely away. That's good. Thank you. Thank you for looking after her. I'll just go now. Bye. Before we continue the next chapter, please like this video and maybe even leave a comment. It would motivate me a lot on my reading journey and recording these audiobooks. Thank you so much. An incident with the police. She stepped back out onto Shakespeare Road with her bag and her chess set, and she really didn't know what to do. There were tingles through her body, not quite pins and needles, more that the strange, fuzzy, static feeling she had felt before when she was nearing the end of a particular existence. Trying to ignore the feeling in her body, she headed in the vague direction of the car park. She passed her old garden flat at 33A Bancroft Avenue. A man she had never seen before was taking a box of recycling out. She thought of the lovely house in Cambridge she now had and couldn't help but compare it to this shabby flat on a litter-strewn street. The tingle subsided a little. She passed Mr. Banerjee's house, or what had been Mr. Banerjee's house. And saw the only owned house on the street that hadn't been divided into flats, though now it looked very different. The small front lawn was overgrown, and there was no sign of the clematis or busy izzies in pots that Nora had watered for him last summer when he'd been recovering from his hip surgery. On the pavement, she noticed a couple of crumbled lager cans. She saw a woman with a blonde bob and tanned skin walking towards her. On the pavement, with two small children in a double pushchair, she looked exhausted. It was the woman she had spoken to in the newsagents the day she had decided to die, the one who had seemed happy and relaxed, Carrie Ann. She hadn't noticed Nora because one child was wailing, and she was trying to pacify the distressed, red-cheeked boy by waving a plastic dinosaur in front of him. Me and Jake were like rabbits, but we got there. Two little terrors, but worth it, you know. I just feel complete. I could show you some pictures. Then Carrie Ann looked up and saw Nora. I know you, don't I? Is it Nora? Yes. Hi, Nora. Hi, Carrie Ann. You remember my name? Oh wow! I was in awe of you in school. You seem to have it all. Did you ever make the Olympics? Yes, actually, kind of. One me did, but it wasn't what I wanted to be. But then, what is right? Carrie Ann seemed momentarily confused, and then her son threw the dinosaur onto the pavement, and it landed next to one of the crumbled cans. Right, Nora picked up the dinosaur, a Stegosaurus on close inspection. 
and handed it to Carrie Ann, who smiled her gratitude and headed on to the house that should have belonged to Mr. Banerjee, just as the boy descended into a full tantrum. Bye, said Nora. Yeah, bye. And Nora wondered what the difference had been. What had forced Mr. Banerjee to go to the care home he'd been determined not to go to? She was the only difference between the two Mr. Banerjees. But what was that difference? What had she done? Set up an online shop? Picked up his prescription a few times? Never underestimate the big importance of small things, Mrs. Elm had said. You must always remember that. She stared at her own window. She thought of herself in her root life, hovering between life and death in her bedroom, equidistant as it were. And for the first time, Nora worried about herself as if she was actually someone else. Not just another version of her, but a different actual person. As though, finally, through all the experiences of life she now had, she had become someone who pitied her former self. Not in self-pity, but she was a different self now. Then someone appeared at her own window. A woman who wasn't her, holding a cat that wasn't Voltaire. This was her hope, anyway, even as she began to feel faint and fuzzy again. She headed into town, walked down the high street. Yes, she was different now. She was stronger. She had untapped things inside her, things she might never have known about if she'd never sung in an arena or fought off a polar bear or felt so much love and fear and courage. There was a commotion outside Boots. Two boys were being arrested by police officers as a nearby store detective spoke into a walkie-talkie. She recognized one of the boys and went up to him. Leo? A police officer motioned for her to back away. Who are you? Leo asked. I... Nora realized she couldn't say your piano teacher, and she realized how mad it was, given the fraught context, to say what she was about to say. But still, she said it. Do you have music lessons? Leo looked down as the handcuffs were put on him. I ain't done no music lessons. His voice has lost its bravado. The police officer was frustrated now. Please, miss, leave this to us. He's a good kid, Nora told him. Please, don't be too hard on him. Well, this good kid just stole 200 quids worth from there and has also just been found to be in position of a concealed weapon. Weapon? A knife. No, there must be some mix-up. He's not that sort of kid. Hear that? The police officer said to his colleague. Lady here thinks our friend Leo Thompson isn't that kind of kid to get into trouble. The police officer laughed. He's always in and out of bother, this one. Now, please. The police officer said, let us do our jobs here. Of course, said Nora. Of course. Do everything they say, Leo. He looked at her as if she'd been sent as a practical joke. A few years ago, his mom, Doreen, had come into string theory to buy her son a cheap keyboard. She'd been worried about his behavior at school, and he'd expressed an interest in music, so she wanted to get him piano lessons. Nora explained she had an electric piano and could play, but had no formal teacher training. Doreen had explained she didn't have much money, but they struck a deal. And Nora had enjoyed her Tuesday evenings, teaching Leo the difference between major and minor sevenths chords and thought he was a great boy, eager to learn. Doreen had seen Leo was getting caught up in the wrong set, but when he got into music, he started doing well in other things too, and suddenly he wasn't getting into trouble with teachers anymore, and he'd play everything from Chopin through Scott Joplin to Frank Ocean and John Legend and Rex Orange County with the same care and commitment. Something Mrs. Elm had said on an early visit to the Midnight Library came to her. Every life contains many millions of decisions, some big, some small. But every time one decision is taken over another, the outcomes differ. An irreversible variation occurs, which in turn leads to further variations. In this timeline right now, the one where she had studied a master's at Cambridge, and married Ash and had a baby, she hadn't been in a string theory on the day four years ago. 
when Doreen and Leo came by. In this timeline, Doreen never found a music teacher who was cheap enough, and so Leo never persisted with music for long enough to realize he had a talent. He never sat there, side by side with Nora on a Tuesday evening, pursuing a passion that he extended at home, producing his own tunes. Nora felt herself weaken, not just tingles and fuzziness, but something stronger, a sense of plunging into nothingness, accompanied by a brief darkening of her vision, a feeling of another Nora right there in the wings, ready to pick up where this one left off, her brain ready to fill in the gaps and have a perfectly legitimate reason to be on a day trip to Bedford and to fill in every absence as if she was here the whole time. Worried she knew what it meant, she turned away from Leo and his friend as they were escorted away to the police car, the eyes of the whole Bedford High Street upon them, and she started to quicken her pace towards the car. This is a good life. This is a good life. This is a good life. A new way of seeing. She got closer to the station, passing the garish red and yellow zigzags of La Cantina, like a Mexican migraine, with a waiter inside taking chairs off tables, and a string theory too, closed, with a handwritten notice on the door. Alas, a string theory is no longer able to trade in this premises. Due to an increase in rent, we simply couldn't afford to go on. Thanks to all our loyal customers. Don't think twice. It's all right. You can go your own way. God only knows what will be without you. It was the exact same note she had seen with Dylan. Judging by the date, written in a small felt-tip letters from Neil's hand, it was from nearly three months ago. She felt sad because a string theory had meant a lot to people, yet Nora hadn't been working at the string theory when it got into trouble. Well, I suppose I did sell a lot of electric pianos and some rather nice guitars too. Growing up, she and Joe had always joked about their hometown, the way teenagers do, and used to say that HMP Bedford was the inner prison and the rest of the town was just the outer prison and any chance you had to escape, you should take it. But the sun was out now as she neared the station, and it seemed that she had been looking at the place wrong all these years. As she passed the statue of prison reformer John Howard in St. Paul's Square, with the trees all around and the river just behind, refracting light, she marveled at it as if she were seeing it for the first time. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Driving back to Cambridge, cocooned in her expensive Audi, smelling almost nauseatingly of vinyl and plastic and other synthetic materials, weaving through busy traffic, the cars sliding by like forgotten lives, she was deeply wishing she had been able to see Mrs. Elm, the real one, before she had died. It would have been good to have one last game of chess with her before she passed away. And she thought of poor Leo, sat in a small windowless cell at a Bedford police station, waiting for Doreen to come and collect him. This is the best life, she told herself a little desperately now. This is the best life. I'm staying here. This is the life for me. This is the best life. This is the best life. But she knew she didn't have long. The flowers have water. She pulled up at the house and ran inside, as Plato padded happily to greet her. Hello? She asked desperately. Ash? Molly? She needed to see them. She knew she didn't have long. She could feel the midnight library waiting for her. Outside, said Ash chirpily from the back garden. And so Nora went through to find Molly on her tricycle again, unfazed by her previous accident, while Ash was tending to a flower bed. How was your trip? Molly climbed off her tricycle and ran over. Mommy, I missed you. I'm really good at biking now. Are you, darling? She hugged her daughter close and closed her eyes and inhaled the scent of her hair and the dog and fabric conditioner and childhood. And she hoped the wonder of it would help keep her there. I love you, Molly. I want you to know that. Forever and ever. Do you understand? Yes, Mommy, of course. And I love your daddy too, and everything will be okay because whatever happens, you will always have daddy, and you will always have mommy too. 
It's just I might not be here in the exact same way. I'll be here, but... She realized Molly needed to know nothing else except one truth. I love you. Molly looked concerned. You forgot Plato. Well, obviously. I love Plato. How could I forget Plato? Plato knows I love him. Don't you, Plato? Plato, I love you. Nora tried to compose herself. Whatever happens, they will be looked after. They will be loved. And they have each other. And they will be happy. Then Ash came over with his gardening gloves on. You okay, Nor? You seem a bit pale. Did anything happen? Oh, oh, I'll tell you about it later, when Molly's in bed. Okay. Oh, there's a shop coming any time, so keep an ear out for the lorry. Sure, yeah, yeah. And then Molly asked if she could get the watering can out, and Ash explained that as it had been raining a lot recently, it wasn't necessary because the sky had been looking after the flowers. They'll be okay, they're looked after. The flowers have water. And the words echoed in Nora's mind. They'll be okay, they're looked after. And then Ash said something about going to the cinema tonight and how the babysitter was all arranged and Nora had forgotten completely but just smiled and tried really hard to hold on, to stay there. But it was happening. It was happening. She knew it from within every hidden chamber of her being, and there was absolutely nothing she could do to stop it. Okay, I think we all know where this book is headed, and I'm kind of glad about the ending. Nowhere to land. No! Unmistakably, it had happened. She was back in the midnight library. Mrs. Elm was at the computer. The lights wobbled and shook and flickered overhead in fast, arrhythmic blinks. Nora, stop. Calm down. Be a good girl. I need to sort this out. Dust fell in thin wisps from the ceiling, from cracks fissuring and spreading like spider webs woven at unnatural speed. There was the sound of sudden, active destruction which, in her sad fury, Nora found herself managing to ignore. You're not Mrs. Elm. Mrs. Elm is dead. Am I dead? We've been through this, but now you mention it. Maybe you're about to be. Why aren't I still there? Why aren't I there? I could sense it was happening, but I didn't want it to. You said that if I found a life I wanted to live in, that I really wanted to live in, then I'd stay there. You said I'd forget about the stupid place. You said I could find the life I wanted. That was the life I wanted. That was the life. Moments ago, she had been in the garden with Ash, Molly, and Palato, a garden humming with life and love. And now she was there. Take me back. You know it doesn't work like that. Well, take me to the closest variation. Give me the closest possible thing to that life, please. Mrs. Elm, it must be possible. There must be a life where I went for the coffee with Ash and where we had Molly and Plato, but I, I did something slightly different. So it was technically another life. Like I chose a different dog color for Plato. Or, or... Or where I, I don't know, where I did Pilates instead of yoga? Or when I went to a different college at Cambridge? Or if it has to be further back where it wasn't coffee on the date but tea? That life, take me to the life where I did that. Come on, please, help me out. I'd like to try one of those lives, please. The computer started to smoke. The screen went black. The whole monitor fell to pieces. You don't understand said Mrs. Elm, defeated, as she collapsed back into the office chair. But that's what happens, isn't it? I pick a regret, something I wished I had done differently. And then you find the book. I open the book and I live the book. That's how this library works, right? It's not that simple. Why? Is there a transference problem? You know, like what happened before? Mrs. Elm looked at her sadly. It's more than that. There was always a strong possibility that your old life would end. I told you that, didn't I? You wanted to die and maybe you would. Yes, but you said I just needed somewhere to go. Somewhere to land. That's what you said. Another life. Those exact words. And all I needed to do was think hard enough and choose the right life and... I know, I know, but it didn't work out like that. 
The ceiling was falling down now in pieces, as if the plaster was no more stable than the icing of a wedding cake. Nora noticed something even more distressing. A spark flew from one of the lights and landed on a book, which consequently ignited into a glowing burst of fire. Pretty soon, fire was spreading along the entire shelf, the books burning as rapidly as if they were dosed in petrol. A whole stream of hot, raging, roaring amber. Then another spark arced towards a different shelf, and that too set alight. At about the same time, a large chunk of dusty ceiling landed by Nora's feet. Under the table, ordered Mrs. Elm. Now! Nora hunched down and followed Mrs. Elm, who was now on all fours, under the table, where she sat on her knees and was forced, like Mrs. Elm, to keep her head down. Why can't you stop this? It's a chain reaction now. Those sparks aren't random. The books are going to be destroyed. And then, just as inevitably, the whole place is going to collapse. Why? I don't understand. I was there. I had found the life for me. The only life for me. The best one in here. But that's the problem, said Mrs. Elm nervously, looking out from beneath the wooden legs of the table as more shells caught on fire and as debris fell all around them. It still wasn't enough. Look. At what? At your watch. Any moment now. So Nora looked and at first saw nothing untoward. But then it was happening. The watch was suddenly acting like a watch. The display was starting to move. Zero o'clock. Zero o one. Zero o two. What's happening? Nora asked, realizing that whatever it was probably wasn't good. Time. That's what's happening. How are we going to leave this place? Zero o nine. Zero o ten. We're not," said Mrs. Elm. "There is no we. I can't leave the library. When the library disappears, so do I. But there's a chance that you can get out, though you don't have long—no more than a minute." Nora had just lost one Mrs. Elm. She didn't want to lose this one too. Mrs. Elm could see her distress. Listen, I'm part of the library, but this whole library is part of you. Do you understand? You don't exist because of the library. The library exists because of you. Remember what Hugo said? He told you that this is the simplest way your brain translates the strange and multifarious reality of the universe. So this is just your brain translating something, something significant and dangerous. I gathered that, but one thing is clear: you didn't want that life. It was the perfect life. Did you feel that all the time? Yes, I mean, I wanted to. I mean, I loved Molly. I might have loved Ash, but I suppose maybe it wasn't my life. I hadn't made it by myself. I had walked into this other version of me. I was carbon copied into the perfect life, but it wasn't me. Zero fifteen. I don't want to die. Said Nora, her voice suddenly raised but also fragile. She was shaking from her very core. I don't want to die. Mrs. Elm looked at her with wide eyes, eyes shining with the small flame of an idea. You need to get out of here. I can't. The library goes on for bloody ever. The moment I walked in it, the entrance disappeared. Then you have to find it again. How? There are no doors. Who needs a door when you have a book? The books are all on fire. There is one that won't be. That's the one you need to find. The book of regrets. Mrs. Elm almost laughed. No, that is the last book you need. That will be ash by now. That will have been the first book to burn. You need to go to that way. She pointed to her left, to chaos and fire and falling plaster. It's the eleventh aisle that way. Third shelf from the bottom, the whole place is going to fall down. Zero twenty one, zero twenty two, zero twenty three. Don't you get it, Nora? Get what? It all makes sense. You came back here this time not because you wanted to die, but because you want to live. 
This library isn't falling down because it wants to kill you. It is falling down because it is giving you a chance to return. Something decisive has finally happened. You have decided you want to be alive. Now go on, live while you still have the chance. But what about you? What's going to happen to you? Don't worry about me," she said. "I promise you, I won't feel a thing." And then she said what the real Mrs. Elm had said when she had hugged Nora back at the school library on the day her dad had died. Things will get better, Nora. It's going to be all right. Mrs. Elm placed the hand above the desk and hastily rummaged for something. A second later, she was handing Nora an orange plastic fountain pen. The kind Nora had owned at school, the one she had noticed ages ago. You'll need this. Why? This one isn't already written. You have to start this. Nora took the pen. Bye, Mrs. Elm. A second later, a massive chunk of ceiling slammed onto the table. A thick cloud of plaster dust clouded them, choking them. Zero thirty-four. Zero thirty-five. Go. <coughs> Live," coughed Mrs. Allen. "Don't ever give up," Nora said. Nora walked through the haze of dust and smoke in the direction Mrs. Elm had pointed towards. As the ceiling continued to fall, it was hard to breathe and to see. But she had just about managed to keep count of the aisles. The sparks from the light fell onto her head. The dust stuck in her throat, nearly causing her to vomit. But even in the powdery fog, she could see that most of the books were now ablaze. In fact, none of the shelves of books seemed intact, and the heat felt like a force. Some of the earliest shelves and books to set on fire were now nothing but ash. Just as she reached the eleventh aisle, she was hit hard by a chunk of falling debris that floored her. Pressed on the rock, she felt the pen slip out of her hand and slide away from her. Her first attempt to free herself was unsuccessful. This is it. I'm going to die, whether I want or not. I'm going to die. The library was a wasteland. Zero forty one, zero forty two. It was all over. She was certain of it once more. She was going to die here, as all her possible lives were ravished all around her. But then she saw it amid a brief clearing in the clouds. There, on the eleventh aisle, that way, third shelf from the bottom, a gap in the fire that was consuming every other book on the shelf. I don't want to die. She had to try harder. She had to want the life she always thought she didn't, because just as this library was a part of her, so too were all the other lives. She might not have felt everything she had felt in those lives, but she had the capability. She might have missed those particular opportunities that led her to become an Olympic swimmer, or a traveler, or a vineyard owner, or a rock star, or a planet-saving glaciologist, or a Cambridge graduate, or a mother, or the million other things. But she was still, in some way, all those people. They were all her. She could have been all those amazing things, and that wasn't depressing, as she had once thought. Not at all. It was inspiring because now she saw the kinds of things she could do when she put herself to work, and that actually the life she had been living had its own logic to it. Her brother was alive, Izzy was alive, and she had helped a young boy stay out of trouble. What sometimes feels like a trap is actually just a trick of the mind. She didn't need a vineyard or a Californian sunset to be happy. She didn't even need a large house and a perfect family. She just needed potential, and she was nothing if not potential. She wondered why she had never seen it before. She heard Mrs. Elm's voice from under the table, somber, far behind her, cutting through the noise. "Don't give up! Don't you dare give up, Nora Seed!" She didn't want to die, and she didn't want to live any other life than the one that was hers, the one that could be a messy struggle, but it was her messy struggle. A beautiful, messy struggle. Zero fifty two, zero fifty three. As she writhed and pushed and resisted the weight on top of her, and as the seconds ticked on, she managed, with a great exertion that burned and stifled her lungs, to.
to get back onto her feet. She scrabbled around on the ground and found the fountain pen, thickly coated in dust, then ran through the particles of smoke to reach the eleventh aisle. And there it was, the only book not burning, still there, perfectly green. Flinching at the heat, and with a careful index finger, she hooked the top of the spine and pulled the book from the shelf. She then did what she always did. She opened the book and tried to find the first page. But the only difficulty was that there was no first page. There were no words in the entire book. It was completely blank. Like the other books, this was the book of her future. But unlike the others, in this one, that future was unwritten. So this was it. This was her life, her root life. And it was a blank page. Nora stood there a moment with her old school pen in hand. It was now nearly one minute after midnight. The other books on the shelf had become charcoal, and the hanging light bulb flickered through the dust, vaguely illuminating the fracturing ceiling. A large piece of ceiling around the light, roughly the shape of France, was looking ready to fall and crush her. Nora took the lid off the pen and pressed the open book against the charred stack of bookshelves. The ceiling groaned. There wasn't long. She started to write, Nora wanted to live. Once she'd finished the inscription, she waited a moment. Frustratingly, nothing happened. And she remembered what Mrs. Elm had once said. Want is an interesting word. It means lack. So she crossed that out and tried again. Nora decided to live. Nothing. She tried again. Nora was ready to live. Still nothing, even when she underlined the word live. Everywhere now, there was breakage and ruination. The ceiling was falling, raising everything, smothering each of the bookshelves into piles of dust. She gaped over and saw the figure of Mrs. Elm, out from under the desk where she had been sheltering Nora, standing there without any fear at all, then disappearing completely as the roof caved in almost everywhere, smothering remnants of fire and shelf stacks and all else. Nora, choking, couldn't see anything at all now. But this part of the library was holding out, and she was still there. Any second now, everything would be gone. She knew it. So she stopped trying to think about what to write and, in sheer exasperation, just put down the first thing that came to her. The thing that she felt inside her like a defiant, silent roar that could overpower any external destruction. The one truth she had. A truth she was now proud of, pleased with, a truth she had not only come to terms with, but welcomed openly, with every fiery molecule of her being. A truth that she scribbled hastily but firmly, pressing deep into the paper with the nib, in capital letters, in that first person present tense, the truth that was the beginning and seed of everything possible, a former curse and a present blessing. Three simple words containing the power and potential of multiverse. I am alive. And with that, the ground shook like fury and every last remnant of the midnight library dissolved into dust. Awakening. At 1 minute and 27 seconds after midnight, Nora Seed marked her emergence back into life by vomiting all over her duvet. Alive, but hardly. Choking, exhausted, dehydrated, struggling, trembling, heavy, delirious, pain in her chest, even more pain in her head. This was the worst life could feel, and yet it was life, and life was precisely what she wanted. It was hard, near impossible, to pull herself off the bed, but she knew she had to get vertical. She managed it somehow and grabbed her phone, but it seemed too heavy and slippy to keep a grasp of, and it fell onto the floor beyond view. Help! She croaked, staggering out of the room. Her hallway seemed to be tilting like it was a ship in a storm, but she reached the door without passing out, then dragged the chain lock off the latch and managed, after great effort, to open it. Please help me! She barely realized it was still raining as she stepped outside in her vomit-stained pajamas, passing the step where Ash had stood a little over a day before to announce the news of her dead cat. There was no one around, no one that she could see, 
So she staggered towards Mr. Banerjee's house in a series of dizzy stumbles and lurches, eventually managing to ring the doorbell. A sudden square of light sprung out from the front window. The door opened. He wasn't wearing his glasses and was confused maybe because of the state of her and the time of night. I'm so very sorry, Mr. Banerjee. I've done something very stupid. You'd better call an ambulance. Oh, my lord. What on earth has happened? Please. Yes, I'll call one right away. Three minutes and 48 seconds past midnight. And that is when she allowed herself to collapse, forwards and with considerable velocity, right onto Mr. Banerjee's doormat. The sky grows dark, the black over blue, yet the stars are still there to shine for you. The other side of despair. Life begins, Sartre once wrote, on the other side of despair. It wasn't raining anymore. She was inside and sitting in a hospital bed. She had been put on a ward and had eaten and was feeling a lot better. The medical staff were pleased, following her physical examination. The tender abdomen was to be expected, apparently. She tried to impress the doctor by telling her a fact Ash had told her about the stomach lining renewing itself every few days. Then a nurse came and sat on her bed with a clipboard and went through reams of questions relating to her state of mind. Nora decided to keep her experience of the midnight library to herself because she imagined that it wouldn't go down too well on a psychiatric evaluation form. It was safe to summarize the little known realities of the multiverse probably weren't yet incorporated within the care plans of the National Health Service. The questions and answers continued for what felt like an hour. They covered medication, her mother's death, volts, losing her job, money worries, the diagnosis of situational depression. Have you ever tried anything like this before? The nurse asked. Not in this life. And how do you feel right now? I don't know, a bit strange, but I don't want to die anymore. And the nurse scribbled on the form. Through the window, after the sun had gone, she watched the tree's gentle movements in the afternoon breeze and distant rush hour traffic shunt slowly along Bedford Ring Road. It was nothing but trees and traffic and mediocre architecture, but it was also everything. It was life. A little later, she deleted her suicidal social media post and, in a moment of sincere sentimentality, she wrote something else instead. She titled it, A Thing I Have Learned written by a nobody who has been everybody. Okay, everyone, listen up. If there's anything we're going to take away from this book, it's this page. A thing I have learned, written by a nobody who has been everybody. It is easy to mourn the lives we aren't living. Easy to wish we'd developed other talents, said yes to different offers. Easy to wish we'd worked harder, loved better, handled our finances more astutely. Been more popular, stayed in the band, gone to Australia, said yes to the coffee, or done more bloody yoga. It takes no effort to miss the friends we didn't make, and the work we didn't do, and the people we didn't marry, and the children we didn't have. It is not difficult to see yourself through the lens of other people, and to wish you were all the different kaleidoscopic versions of you they wanted you to be. It is easy to regret, and keep regretting, ad infinitum until our time runs out. But it is not the lives we regret not living that are the real problem. It is the regret itself. It's the regret that makes us shrivel and wither and feel like our own and other people's worst enemy. We can't tell if any of those other versions would have been better or worse. Those lives are happening, it is true. But you are happening as well. And that is the happening we have to focus on. Of course, we can't visit every place or meet every person or do every job. Yet most of what we'd feel in any life is still available. We don't have to play every game to know what winning feels like. We don't have to hear every piece of music in the world to understand music. We don't have to have tried every variety of grape from every vineyard to know the pleasure of wine. Love and laughter and fear and pain are universal currencies. We just have to close our eyes and savor the taste of the drink in front of us and listen to the song as it plays. We are as completely and utterly alive as we are in any other life and have access to the same emotional spectrum. 
We only need to be one person. We only need to feel one existence. We don't have to do everything in order to be everything because we are already infinite. While we are alive, we always contain a future of multifarious possibility. So let's be kind to the people in our own existence. Let's occasionally look up from the spot in which we are because wherever we happen to be standing, the sky above us goes on forever. Yesterday, I knew I had no future and that it was impossible for me to accept my life as it is now. And yet today, that same messy life seems full of hope, potential. The impossible, I suppose, happens via living. Will my life be miraculously free from pain, despair, grief, heartbreak, hardship, loneliness, depression? No. But do I want to live? Yes. Yes. A thousand times, yes. That was beautiful. Living versus understanding. A few minutes later, her brother came to see her. He'd heard the voicemail she'd sent him and had responded by a text at seven minutes after midnight. You okay, sis? Then when the hospital contacted him, he'd caught the first train from London. He'd bought the latest issue of National Geographic for her while waiting at St. Pancras station. You used to love it, he told her as he placed the magazine beside the hospital bed. I still do. It was good to see him, his thick eyebrows and reluctant smile still intact. He walked in a little awkward, head cowed, hair longer than it had been in the last two lives in which she had seen him. I'm sorry I've been incommunicado recently, he said. It wasn't about what Robbie said it was about. I don't even think about the labyrinths anymore. I was just in a weird place. After mom died, I was seeing the sky and we had a very messy breakup. And I just didn't want to have to talk to you or recently to anyone about it. I just wanted to drink and I was drinking too much. It was a real problem, but I've started getting help for it. I haven't had a drink for weeks. I go to the gym and everything now. I've started a cross training class. Oh, Joe, poor you. I'm sorry about the breakup and everything else. You're all I've got, sis, he says, his voice cracking a little. I know I haven't valued you. I know I wasn't always the best growing up, but I had my own shit going on, having to be a certain way because of that, hiding my sexuality. I know it wasn't easy for you, but it wasn't easy for me either. You were good at everything, school, swimming, music. I couldn't compete. Plus, dad was that, and I had to be this fake version of whatever he thought a man was. He sighed. It's weird, we both probably remember it in different ways. But don't leave me, okay? Leaving the band was one thing, but don't leave existence. I couldn't cope with that. I won't if you won't, she said. Trust me, I'm not going anywhere. She thought of the grief that had flooded her when she had heard about Joe's death by overdose in Sao Paulo, and she asked him to hug her, and he obliged, delicately, and she felt the living warmth of him. Thanks for trying to jump in the river for me, she said. What? I always thought you didn't, but you tried. They pulled you back. Thank you. He suddenly knew what she was talking about, and maybe more than a little confused about how she knew it when she had been swimming away from him. Ah, oh, sis, I love you. We were young fools. Joe nipped out for an hour, picked up the keys from her landlord, collected her sister's clothes and phone. She saw that Izzy had texted, Sorry, I didn't get back last night or this morning. I wanted a proper discussion. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The whole works. How are you? I miss you. Oh, and guess what? I'm thinking of coming back to the UK in June, for good. Miss you, my friend. Also, have a ton of humpback pics coming your way. Nora made a slight noise of involuntary joy at the back of her throat. She texted back. It was interesting, she mused to herself, how life simply gave you a whole new perspective by waiting around long enough for you to see it. I stand by this sentence, though, by the way, based on personal experience. Sometimes when you're confused, just have to let time reveal everything for you. She went on the Facebook page of the International Polar Research Institute. There was a photograph of the woman she had shared a cabin with, Ingrid, standing with the field leader, Peter. 
using a thin measuring drill to gauge the thickness of sea ice and a link to an article headlined, IPRI research confirms last decade warmest on record for Arctic region. She shared the link and posted a comment, keep up the great work, and decided that when she earned some money, she would donate. It was agreed that Nora could go home. Her brother ordered an Uber. As they were pulling out of the car park, Nora saw Ash driving into the hospital. He must have been on a late shift. He had a different car in this life. He didn't see her, despite her smile, and she hoped he was happy. She hoped he only had an easy shift of gallbladders ahead of him. Maybe she would go along and watch him in the Bedford Half Marathon on Sunday. Maybe she would ask him out for a coffee. Maybe. In the back of the car, her brother told her he was looking for some freelance session work. I'm thinking of becoming a sound engineer, he said. Vaguely, anyway. Nora was happy to hear this. Well, I think you should do it. I think you'd like it. I don't know why, I've just got a feeling. Okay. I mean, it might not be as glamorous as being an international rock star, but it might be safer, maybe even happier. That was a tough sell, and Joe wasn't entirely buying it, but he smiled and nodded to himself. Actually, there's a studio in Hammersmith, and they're looking for sound engineers. It's only five minutes from me. I could walk it. Hammersmith? Yes, that's the one. What do you mean? I mean, I just think it sounds good. Hammersmith, sound engineer. It sounds like you'd be happy. He laughed at her. Okay, Nora, okay. And that gym I was telling you about, it's right next door to that place. Ah, uh, cool. Any nice guys there? Actually, yes, there is one. He's called Ewan. He's a doctor. He goes to cross-training. Ewan, yes. Who? You should ask him out. Joe laughed, thinking Nora was just being playful. I'm not even 100% sure he's gay. He is. He's gay. He's 100% gay. And 100% into you. Dr. Ewan Langford. Ask him out. You have to trust me. It will be the best thing you ever do. Her brother laughed as the car pulled up at 33A Bancroft Avenue. He paid on account of Nora still having no money and no wallet. Mr. Banerjee sat at his window, reading. Out on the street, Nora saw her brother staring in astonishment down at his phone. What's up, Joe? He could hardly speak. Longford. Sorry? Dr. Even Longford. I didn't even know his surname was Langford, but that's him. Nora shrugged. Sibling intuition. Add him. Follow him. DM him. Whatever you have to do. Well, no unsolicited nude pics. But he's the one. I'm telling you, he's the one. But how did you know it was him? She took her brother by the arm and knew there was no explanation she could possibly give. Listen to me, Joe. She remembered the anti-philosophy of Mrs. Elm in the Midnight Library. You don't have to understand life. You just have to live it. As her brother headed towards the door of 33A Bancroft Avenue, Nora looked around at all the terraced houses and all the lampposts and trees under the sky, and she felt her lungs inflate at the wonder of being there, witnessing it all as if for the first time. Maybe in one of those houses was another slider. Someone under third or seventeenth or final version of themselves. She would look out for them. She looked at number 31. Through his window, Mr. Banerjee's face slowly lit up as he saw Nora safe and sound. He smiled and mouthed a thank you as if simply her act of living was something he should be grateful for. Tomorrow, she would find some money and go to the garden center and buy him a plant for his flower bed. Foxgloves, maybe. She was sure he liked foxgloves. No, she called back, blowing him a friendly kiss. Thank you, Mr. Banerjee. Thank you for everything. And he smiled broader, and his eyes were full of kindness and concern, and Nora remembered what it was to care and to be cared for. She followed her brother inside her flat to start tidying up, catching a glimpse of the cluster of irises in Mr. Banerjee's garden as she went, flowers she hadn't appreciated before, but which now mesmerized her with the most exquisite purple she had ever seen. 
as though the flowers weren't just colors but part of a language, notes in a glorious floral melody as powerful as Chopin, silently communicating the breathtaking majesty of life itself. The Volcano It is a quiet revelation to discover that the place you wanted to escape to is the exact same place you escaped from. That the prison wasn't the place, but the perspective. I'm trying to live by this. And the most peculiar discovery Nora made was that, of all the extremely divergent variation of herself she had experienced, the most radical sense of change happened within the exact same life, the one she began and ended with. This biggest and most profound shift happened not by becoming richer or more successful or more famous, or by being amid the glaciers and polar bears of Svalbard. It happened by waking up in the exact same bed, in the same grotty damp apartment with its dilapidated sofa and yoga plant and tiny potted cacti and bookshelves and untried yoga manuals. There was the same electric piano and books. There was the same sad absence of a feline and lack of a job. There was still the same unknowability about her life ahead. And yet, everything was different. And it was different because she no longer felt she was there simply to serve the dreams of other people. She no longer felt like she had to find soul fulfillment as some imaginary perfect daughter or sister or partner or wife or mother or employee or anything other than a human being obtaining her own purpose and answerable to herself. There's an Indian mystic called Sadguru that um, talks basically about this. Just look for his videos on YouTube. I'm sure you'll find them enlightening. And it was different because she was alive when she had so nearly been dead. And because that had been her choice, a choice to live, because she had touched the vastness of life and within that vastness, she had seen the possibility not only of what she could do, but also feel. There were other scales and other tunes. There was more to her than a flat line of mild to moderate depression, spiced up with occasional flourishes of despair. And that gave her hope, and even the sheer sentimental gratitude of being able to be here, knowing she had the potential to enjoy watching radiant skies and mediocre Ryan Bailey comedies and be happy listening to music and conversation and the beat of her own heart. And it was different because, above all things, that heavy and painful book of regrets had been successfully burned to dust. Hi, Nora, it's me, Doreen. Nora was excited to hear from her as she had been in the middle of neatly writing a notice advertising piano lessons. Oh, Doreen, can I just apologize about missing the lesson the other day? Water under the bridge. Well, I'm not going to go into all the reasons, Nora continued breathlessly. But I still just say that I will never be in that situation again. I promise, in future, should you want to continue with Leo's piano lessons, I will be where I am meant to be. I won't let you down. Now, I totally understand if you don't want me to be Leo's piano teacher anymore. But I want you to know that Leo is an exceptional talent. He has a feel for the piano. He could end up making a career out of it. He could end up at the Royal College of Music. So... I would just like to say, if he doesn't continue his lessons with me, I want you to know that I feel he should continue them somewhere. That's all. There was a long pause. Nothing but the fuzzy static of phone breath. Nora, love, it's okay. I don't need a monologue. The truth is, we were in town yesterday. The two of us. I was buying him some face wash and he said, I'm still going to do piano, right? Right there in boots. Shall we just kick off where we left off next week? Seriously? That's amazing. Yes, next week then. And the moment Nora came off the phone, she sat at the piano and played a tune that had never been played before. She liked what she was playing and vowed to remember it and put some words to it. Maybe she could turn it into a proper song, put it out there online. Maybe she would write more songs. Or maybe she would save up and apply for a master's. Or maybe she would do both. Who knew? As she played, she glanced over and saw her magazine, the one Joe had bought her, open at the picture of the Krakatoa volcano in Indonesia. 
The paradox of volcanoes was that they were symbols of destruction, but also life. Once the lava slows and cools, it solidifies and then breaks down over time to become soil, rich, fertile soil. She wasn't a black hole, she decided. She was a volcano, and like a volcano, she couldn't run away from herself. She'd have to stay there and tend to that wasteland. She could plant a forest inside herself. And the last part. How it ends. Mrs. Elm looked a lot older than she had done at the Midnight Library. Her formerly gray hair was now white and thin. Her face tired and lined as a map. Hands spotted with age. But she was as adept at chess as she had been years ago in the Hazel Dean School Library. Oakleaf Care Home had its own chessboard, but it had needed a dust down. No one plays here, she told Nora. I'm so pleased you came to see me. It was such a surprise. Well, I can come every day if you want, Mrs. Elm. Louise, please call me Louise. And don't you have work to do? Nora smiled, even though it had only been 24 hours since she had asked Neil to put her poster in a string theory. She was already inundated with people wanting lessons. I teach piano lessons, and I help out at the homeless shelter every other Tuesday, but I will always have an hour, and to be honest, I have no one to play chess with either. A tired smile spread across Mrs. Elm's face. Well, that would be lovely. She stared out of the little window in her room, and Nora followed her gaze. There was a human and a dog Nora recognized. It was the Len, walking Sally the Bull Mastiff the nervous one with the cigarette burns who had taken a shine to her. She wondered vaguely if her landlord would allow her to get a dog. It allowed a cat after all, but she'd have to wait until she'd caught up with the rent. It can be lonely, Mrs. Elm said. Being here, just sitting, I felt like the game was up, like a lonely king on a board. You see, I don't know how you remember me, but outside of school, I wasn't always the... She hesitated. I've let people down. I haven't always been easy. I've done things I regret. I was a bad wife. Not always a good mother either. People have given up a little on me, and I don't entirely blame them. Well, you were kind to me, Mrs. Louise. When I had a hard time at school, you always knew what to say. Mrs. Elm steadied her breath. Thank you, Nora. And you're not alone on that board now. A pawn has come and joined you. You were never a pawn. She made her move, a bishop sweeping into a strong position. A slight smile tugged at the corners of her mouth. You're going to win this, Nora observed. Mrs. Elm's eyes sparkled with sudden life. Well, that's the beauty, isn't it? You just never know how it ends. And Nora smiled as she stared at all the pieces she still had left in play, thinking about her next move. And the end. Thank you so much for supporting me, liking my videos, and leaving a comment. I'm going to start recording another book soon, but I haven't decided which one. I've been reading some self-help books. But I don't know if I should read all of them or like summarize the entire book in like an hour video for you. Just let me know in the comments below.